this conference will now be recorded. All right, welcome everyone. It is December 2nd and it's the first meeting of December for the RTD Accountability Committee's um, Operations Committee. So hi everyone. I see most of the committee members on the line. So we will go ahead and jump into the agenda just as a quick overview for folks and for those that may be on the phone. Um, we'll start out by quick, with a quick overview of our last meeting. I just want to get a sense from folks if you all had a chance to read the minutes and if you have any comments or questions, additions that we may need to add. We'll then transition into an overview of a fair, if a fair framework. Um, so we have asked uh, Stephen from the Transit Center to join us um, to go into this report a little bit. It has come up a few times during our uh, last couple of meetings and it seemed like it may just be helpful for us to get that framework from him. We'll then transition into Natalie's brief presentation on um, highlighting the Houston network and then we'll move into a discussion. So I am going to turn off my webcam because I'm getting a notice that my internet may be slow. Um, so moving into the agenda, do folks have any uh, comments or questions related to the meeting summary from our November 18th meeting? Okay, hearing none. I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Stephen. Um, so within the packet, you all, uh, towards the I'm going to say it was attachment B. Um, the report is provided within that, and I'm hoping that folks had an opportunity to read it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Stephen with Transit Center to provide just a brief presentation and overview. Stephen? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, before I get started, um, I did actually have a, a few slides that I can share if, um, if you have the ability to uh, make me a presenter, or alternately, I can... Um, yeah. I can actually share a link to the presentation and have someone else share the screen. Um, or if that's difficult, I can just, you know, talk through it. I think I'm fine. Uh, any of those three ways. Matthew, do you think that might be possible to make Stephen host? Great. All right. Looks like you should have that ability now, Stephen. Okay. Let me. Uh, let's see. Hold on. Um, hold on. Sorry. There should be a, a share screen icon in the center bottom that you can click on. Yep. I see it. It's just giving me a uh, a little extra pop up that I have to turn some uh some other feature on so i'm trying to uh to do that all right hopefully that will all right i, I may need to uh, rejoin the meeting so just give me one second to hold on. great so while steven is rejoining i will give just a little bit more context it's like there He's back. Never mind. All right. I okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Could you uh, make me the host again? Okay. All so right. Should be presenter. Okay. So let me go ahead and thanks for that. Thanks for your patience. Um, so yes, uh, again, I'm Stephen Higashide. I'm the director of research at Transit Center, and I'm happy to uh, share some information from our fair framework report. Um, I do want to, you know, say upfront, um, you know, our the I was not one of the authors of the report. The primary author is actually on parental leave right now. So there, there may be some questions that come up later that I may need to you know, take back and, and get back to the group. And I'm certainly happy to do that. Um, 
for anyone who's not familiar with Transit Center, we are a New York-based foundation that works to make cities more just, sustainable, and prosperous through better transit. We do that by supporting uh, civic and community organizations that are running uh, local campaigns for better transit service. We do research into what makes people choose transit, how to make it more operationally efficient. We also work directly with transit agency partners, in some cases provide uh, technical assistance, do things like run a um, women's transportation leadership cohort. Um, and so we try to work with folks inside and outside of government who really care about making transit better. Um, in terms of the FAIR framework report, there are really, I think, three takeaways that I want to emphasize here. Um, first, in the report, we really talk about the fact that FAIR policy needs to be guided by goals, whether that's you know, trying to drive ridership, improve racial equity, uh, maintain financial sustainability. Those are all goals that are bigger and broader than something like fare box recovery. You know, RTD here has a legislative mandate for that, and it's a metric that um, you know really people pay a lot of attention to in the transit world. But that by itself, it's just it's just one metric. It's not a goal, and by itself, it can distort. Uh, service planning in ways that might be counter to other goals that are very important to uh, to the board or to decision makers. And so setting those goals is very important. Um, and in addition, in the report, we also talk a lot about the fact that fares should be easy to understand and easy for riders to pay, which means making sure, for example, that there are multiple methods of payment, that if folks don't have access to a smartphone option, that there are, that there are many places that they can access uh, a transit pass, that the pass programs are easy to sign up for, even all the way down to you know the fare machines themselves, how easy are they to use. Um, and so in the report, we talk about a few different examples that I'll walk through um, very quickly so I can try to uh, maintain some time for questions and answers. In the report, we looked at the San Francisco MTA, which uh, sets four goals to guide their fare policy around driving ridership, trying to incentivize uh, prepayment, so not cash fares, but but uh, folks buying fares in advance. Um, and then this real focus on convenience and equity. And so what are some of the ways that those goals translate into actual uh, operational policy? San Francisco MTA is the only transit system in the US where on any bus, customers can board at any door and there's a proof of payment system somewhat similar to on the commuter rail here, that's led to faster boarding, more reliable buses. Uh, there hasn't been there has been no increase in fare evasion, and so that's a direct. Um, you can draw a line between that and the goal of trying to incentivize uh, ridership. Um, and they also have a, a free transit program for low and moderate income seniors, youth, and people with disabilities. A third um, example we looked at was TriMet. Uh, the main transit operator in the Portland, Oregon region. They had many other goals. This is not even the full list of goals. Um, and I think it's important to point out here that there are some goals that, um, you know, they can be in tension with each other. You may have to balance between those goals, but simply having those goals means that there can be a fuller, more holistic conversation around how fair policy is set. And so some of the results of having this set of goals include uh, TriMet really led the development of a regional fare card, the HOP Pass, which is pictured here, and many of the smaller um, providers in the region now are, are on that pass. That has greatly simplified the fare structure from the rider perspective. Uh, they have a fare capping on their system so that um, even if you if you're paying as you go, nobody pays more than the cost of a monthly pass in a given month. Um, and I can talk a little more about you know technically how does that how does that happen? Uh, they were also um, I think one of the leading agencies in really addressing you know decriminalization of fare evasion. They created a uh, a different a differently tiered structure where um, you know it's now an administrative fine. Um, folks can perform community service in lieu of a fine. And for low income riders who uh, fare evade the first time, instead of either of those penalties, they can actually sign up for the low income fare program and put 
money on the low income fare card, and that way they're diverted out of the penalty system. So the third example that we talked about in the report is King County Metro, the, uh, the main uh, bus operator in the Seattle region. And you'll see this is an even, uh, again, it's, it's a longer list of goals. Um, I think you'll see there's some similar themes here between them and the other agencies that you saw having to do with financial sustainability, operational efficiency, uh, coordinating with other transit agencies in the region, and minimizing the impact on those least able to pay. Um, when you look at the King County Metro, uh, when you look at uh, what they've done, some of the things that really stand out in their fair policy, you know, first, about eight or nine years ago, they greatly simplified the fare system, which had been uh, quite complex. Um, and we've actually seen in, in Austin, Texas as well, another situation where um, there were these very fine-grained distinctions between service that that might not have seemed very different from the rider perspective, and simplifying it led to an increase in ridership. They're, they also do an exceptionally good job of making the low-income fare program easy uh, to use, and they really proactively meet low-income riders where they are, whether that's at schools, transit hubs, having a table at the library, coming to individual housing complexes to sign up users. Uh, there, there are also a lot of partnerships with uh, social service and other service providers. So for example, you can sign up for the low income fare program at the same place that you would sign up for Affordable Care Act health insurance. Um, I think a few areas that I think are really important for discussion within RTD, this whole issue of understandability and ease of use. It did seem to me when I looked at the low income fare program at RTD that there's not the same sort of ease of enrollment. There's not the same sort of breadth of partnerships that it's much more, that it's perhaps more burden put on people to find and apply for the program. And that seems to translate even into, for example, the fare machines, which put a lot of burden on the user in some situations to proactively select the cheapest fare. Uh, you know, generally speaking, you want to make it so that it's very rare that the, that the system you know, sort of overcharges you. And the way the fare machines are set up here, um, it, it's, sort of the other, it's sort of the opposite. The burden is really put on users. And so uh, those are just a couple things that stood out to me. I'd be very interested, I'd be very interested to hear from you all whether that is an overall concern that the, that the fare system um, isn't as easy to use as it could be, or it's harder to understand than it should be. Um, I think transit agencies everywhere in the wake of racial justice protests earlier in the year are really thinking a lot about doing fair enforcement in a way that doesn't put folks in harm's way, and, you know, both riders and operators, since fair enforcement can be such a, um, such a cause of friction. And then I think third, I just want to emphasize again that it really all starts with actually having a conversation about what the goals actually are for RTD fare policy. And I think it's an open question whether that's an appropriate role for this group, whether that's something that should be driven by the RTD board, but that's really the foundation for the kinds of um, you know, fare policy reforms that we talk about in the report is actually having that conversation about both the overall goals for the transit system and then how fare policy can contribute to that. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I, and I really want to um, get into some conversation and, and questions and answer because I, I feel like, um, you know, what we tried to do in this report is lay out a framework, um, but it really is about having that goal oriented conversation uh, with folks who are uh, steering the governance of RTD. So thank you. And uh, let me go ahead and open it up for questions now. Great, thank you so much, Stephen, um, first of all, for joining us. I am gonna open it up to members of the committee and see if you all have questions. Um, Stephen, if you wouldn't mind uh, not sharing your screen, that way we can see each other, that would be great. Um, members of the committee, are there any questions that folks have? Oh, no. Give me one, okay. Give me one second, Elise, it, or, or not Elise, Jackie, it looks like, 
or at least may accidentally disconnected from the meeting. I do not see him in the attendee list anymore. Okay, let's just open it up for questions and we can um, go from there. He's back. So, sorry guys. He's back. You know, I'm so used to I'm so used to Zoom that I think some of the slightly different features in GoToMeeting are throwing me off a little bit. So apologize for that. <laughs> You're back, thank you. Jackie um, has a question for you and then Elise. Well, first I just wanna say thank you. That was really, I think, very informative and helpful. And I think also kind of confirmed a lot of the discussion that we've been having about how to keep it simple or simplify the process. Um, I, I guess I'm wondering if you have any follow-up data on the fair enforcement and how, uh, I thought I was very interested in that and how, um, what has changed with the organizations that have tried, you know, given, I forget, I forget how, what you even call it, but kind of forgiven the first um, mm -hmm. breach and really tried to bring them into the system with access to the, the cards? Have you heard any, right. do you have any more data on the success um, of those programs? You know, I, I don't have follow-up data specifically on those. I, it certainly doesn't seem like anyone has regretted it. Um, one additional piece of uh, additional piece of research or additional strain of research, uh, I think that there, and I'm happy to send this. Um, it's important to try to understand, you know, why people fare evade in the first place. There's a lot of research, for example, coming out of the the, the University of Monash in Australia is sort of like they're the folks who have done the most work on this, and what you see is, on the one hand. A, a relatively small number of people who are sort of recidivist evaders. And then you see this much larger group of people who only evade a few times and it tends to be because, um, you know, maybe the system is too confusing for them to figure out. You know, they're just, they just, they're, they see the train coming and they're like, well, I don't have time to figure this out. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna run for it. Um, or, you know, someone who maybe the bus only takes coins, which is the case in some places that they don't they don't have it, so they just get on. Um, and and so, one implication of that is that you have to you have to make the fair enforcement system forgiving to the majority of people who um, are doing it, you know, sort of unintentionally or only a few times, um, as well as you know being cognizant that. You know, if it if it's low income riders who really can't afford to pay, what are you gaining by, you know, covering them in fines as well? Um, it's, you know, people sometimes people are just making that rational choice because they have to make the choice between, you know, having money for food or for transportation. So. Yep. Absolutely, and I appreciate the the connection to the ease of use for the system because I think that's also an opportunity for RTD to improve. So thank you. Please. Yeah, I want to thank you for this um, as the presentation as well. It is super helpful. Um, the, I guess I have two questions. One is sort of the process for setting goals. Our committee doesn't have the authority to set the goals, but we have the authority to make recommendations. So we could mm -hmm. make recommendations on what we think those goals are, or merely to suggest to the board that they need to do that. But so I, any any feedback you have on sort of what's the best process for that, mm -hmm. love to hear that. And then the second part is, you know, the tension between using um, fairs as a way to help um, during, particularly during these financially challenging times as a revenue generator um, versus to actually increase ridership. I, I'm just wondering how, and I, I did not spend as much time with your report as I wanted to, but um, how the, the agencies you looked at balance that out. And it mm -hmm. seems like most of them have low, low income programs. So did they sort of separate that piece out and then try to use fares to cover mm -hmm. the cost of service like i'm just curious what what balancing you think mm -hmm. makes most sense yeah um you know i i think low income fare program is a great example of of trying to to balance 
equity, ridership, and financial sustainability goals. Um, it is the, it is the case that if you have if you have a low income fare program, low income uh, people will ride more. There was a there's been some um, I think pretty con pretty convincing research. Some uh, researchers from MIT uh, did a uh, randomized controlled trial um, giving uh, some Boston area riders discounted fares, uh, others you know no discount, and had them sort of journal how they traveled around the system and folks who got the low income fare rode about 30% more, um, were riding much more to get to healthcare. Uh, so these so these are really important trips and it's driving ridership, perhaps at the cost of some financial sustainability, but that's just one example of, of balancing it. Um, in some jurisdictions, the, they, they sort of, they, the low income fare program has a dedicated revenue source. So for example, some of the funding for the low income fare in the Seattle region comes from this uh, dedicated tax within Seattle itself. Um, you know, and, and in, some, in some jurisdictions, like if there's discounted fare for youth, for example, that might come from the school district or you know, municipal general fund as opposed to from the transit agency itself so that's one way to try and to try and uh, create programs like that without having as much impact on the agency's uh, financial sustainability um, to your first question about the the role of the committee um, you know I mean you all may I, I, I see I see no reason why the committee couldn't make some recommendations around um, you know ideal goals for RGD to take up. Um, you know I think that this this from what I understand this committee has been created um, you know with a with a broad mandate and because there's broad recognition that there's value in in reimagining how regional transit works and so I think it would be um, completely appropriate to to recommend some possible goals. Thanks. Lynn, I see you came on camera. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, just, uh, do you have a question? I do. Um, th that was great, thank you. I think it's, it's very interesting. So I, I am uh, uh, one of the two representatives on the committee from the RTD board. And, um, you know, looking at it, um, I'm, I'm interested in this and, and taking it back to the board and potentially having you come. But I'm wondering, you had, uh, you mentioned the research around people you riding the, the buses and trains more with the low income fare with the discount. Mm -hmm. Do you have research, have you seen research about the effect of having a pass in your pocket, an annual pass or, or something like that? Do mm -hmm. this, how much more people ride then? Mm -hmm. um I'm not sure I could cite any any offhand, but I certainly, um, from my understanding, yeah, I mean, certainly it takes a lot of the friction out of the experience, right? Um, and there are only a few, there aren't that many places that have an annual pass, but certainly I think the the consensus is for, you know, when people have a monthly pass, um, they ride more often and they, and they ride more often for those kinds of incidental trips. So I would think the same would be true of, uh, of an annual pass. Thank you. Kristen? I was curious, you're talking about capping fares, mm -hmm. the, um, or the pay as you go instead of coming up with the chunk of money for the monthly pass. And I think that is a, a hindrance for a lot of households to be able to come up with $140 mm -hmm. in one lump sum. So in the research, does that show that the pay as you go instead of, and then capping it according to don't pay more than you would with a monthly pass? Has that increased ridership? Um. I think that fare capping is new enough. It, you know, it's it's only with the most recent generation uh, generation of smart car technology that this that this feature 
can be built in. Sure. So I think it's um I think that we don't really have we don't have enough data to show uh the effect on ridership. Um but certainly I think there's a strong equity reason to to have the the fair capping. Um because it is it is quite common for uh someone who just has to pay as they as they go they end up spending more than it would be if they had been able to buy a monthly pass. So, so having the technological ability to now cap the fare, um, uh, it, it seems like a like a bit of a, a bit of a no-brainer. But in terms of, the, I, I would love to see more data on it. I think with that, um, it's only become possible in the last few years. I'd like to see that go into our pile of recommendations, Dave. Yeah, I did have an, a question on the fare capping. Um, Stephen, do you typically see that with um, folks that have the smart card ability? Because I think one other thing that um, has come up a few, or at least I remember this coming up a few times during the, the past program working group process was that folks were really wanting to continue having paper passes. So there was this tension between paper passes and the, the card passes. So I'm just curious if you all have any research on that as well. Yeah, I mean... I don't think you would be able to do fair capping with the um, with the paper pass system. Um, I mean, one thing I'll say generally is that there's a lot that there, there's a lot of ways you can make the there's a lot of ways you can try to simplify the fair system, even with uh, even with paper media um and and i do think sometimes it is worth it is worth asking you know what's the um what's the what's the cost benefit on you know paying for a lot of new uh fair payment infrastructure um so th th that's kind of a that's kind of a general comment mm -hmm. um i don't know that i have a a full answer. I you know fair, fair capping certainly, I think, would be pretty challenging with uh, with yeah. a paper pass system. Um, but I imagine that so, that that is motivated by trying to make it easy as easy as possible for writers, right? Yeah. We'll take some more questions, Chris. I see that you unmuted yourself, but I also see Rhett raising his hand. So I'll go Rhett and then Chris. And then we'll wrap this part, portion up. Just a real quick question. Um, the, the other model that would be a possibility, I would think, is if a person doesn't use a certain amount, they buy a monthly pass, but they don't ride as much, then having some of that carry forward, just like your, you know, your minutes do in a telephone, you know, a cell phone program or something like that. Has anybody looked at that as an alternate model? That way, you feel like. You don't lose it if you if you don't use it. You still you'll still have the ability to have it. And again, as as other people have noted, if you've got that pass in your pocket, you're a lot more likely to use it. Partnership is to me the most important single thing here. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen it, but it sounds like a good idea to me. I think it's I think um, you know, why not? It certainly is something that the um, that the technology should be capable of. And there's another um, kind of re related, even though it's not the same, a lot of um, a lot of systems allow you to carry a negative balance. So if say if you get on if you get on the bus and it just turns out you've run out of money on your card, instead of you know, instead of you just being out of luck, um, they'll let you put you know, they'll, you'll say, uh, they'll say, oh, well, you know, your $2 in debt on your card, just pay it back to us the next time you're at a fair payment machine. Um, and they don't, you know, you can't rack up like a huge balance, but it just makes it a little more forgiving for folks so that if you, just, you know, if you happen not to have money on your card, you can still ride. Yeah, it beats, a, it beats having to pay a fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, uh, Chris. Um, I'm not think I don't think I have anything particularly. I feel like since I put myself on camera now, I should say something really smart. Um, I, I will at least note. I think it is worth noting 
Um, and in the ski industry, as everyone knows, um, the pre-purchase of pass and the cash flow consistency has created two massive businesses in Bell Resorts and Altera's Mountain Company. Um, both of them based on selling passes well in advance. I mean, they sell those things six months beforehand. It stabilizes their budget immensely. Um, they are very, very much dedicated to it. So if you want to walk up and buy a ticket at Vail today, it's $220. The average price of an actual ticket at Vail is about $85. So their pre-sale is massive. Um, and they, it's, it's intentional. I mean, they are trying very much to get people into it. I don't know exactly how that relates to us here, but I think it does have, I think it does have merit. And while I understand there are some people who might not be able to buy passes in advance, there is value to us as an organization to have that predictable cash flow and to be able to see it. So, um, and I think ridership is one of our primary goals, getting those things into people's pocket and then it just becomes part of their habit is is really a big deal. So um, there you go. And for what it's worth. Elise. I just wanted to respond to say the whole Eco Pass program does sort of replicate that ski pass thing because you're deciding a year in advance that you're going to do this and and at least here we we do monthly checks um to rtd so it it, it does play a revenue stabilization role that i think is valuable and something that we should be considering more doing more of as a result yeah i think so just one final question and then we'll wrap up uh steven this this conversation um, right now around, for example, the eco passes. So the business, basically, let's just call them the business passes, pass program, things like that. I'm just curious, did your report take a look at that um, in addition to all of these other fair and pass structures? And if there's anything that we may want to glean from, from, from any research that you all have done on that piece? Mm -hmm. um, this specific report didn't look at eco pass style programs, but I do think that it's, um, I do think that that it can be, it can be a, a, a power a powerful model. It does provide um, in normal times that more predictable cash flow in the Bay Area. Um, I mean, you you may already have something like this, but but in the Bay Area there are a lot of um, there are a lot of like apartment complexes that will uh, provide transit passes to residents. Uh, as an amenity, and the transit agencies out there do bulk pricing for uh, for the residential complexes. Um, you know, it's in most places it's it's much more common for these type of eco pass programs to be something that's aimed just at employers, but um, but trying to incentivize uh, residential complexes to do it or neighborhoods, um, it can be powerful. I mean, my understanding is that um, there are some folks in the region who feel like maybe RTD has become over-reliant on the eco pass. Um, to me, that to me that that gets back to this question about what's what are the goals of fair policy to begin with? You know, the eco pass can be a really good model. It's just this question of how are you balancing the different things you're trying to achieve with your fair policy. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Stephen, for, for joining us and um, for providing this overview. I am uh, just wondering if you may be able to share the PowerPoint with us afterwards, um, just as a supplement to the report. Um, and then if folks have any additional questions, um, I'm sure we're, we're happy to share your contact information if you feel comfortable with that, um, especially yeah. for members of the committee. So. Yeah, I, I'm happy to share the slides and, and definitely feel free to uh, share my contact information. Great. Thank yeah, you so much, I made, Stephen. Uh, I think I'll, I'll I'll stick around for the next presentation too, because I I just am curious. So yeah, <laughs> no, please do. Um, speaking of which, Matthew, Stephen, I didn't you, I unmuted yourself. Oh, I was just going to say, Stephen, you can you can send it to me, and I'll distribute it to the to the committee. Okay. Great. All right. Um, so next item on the agenda is Natalie Shishido. She's going to do a brief presentation on um, her findings from the city of Houston. I know that's, again, popped up as part of this conversation. So Natalie, let's make sure that you have share screen abilities and then we'll allow you to get started. Great. I should be able to do that.
All right. Is it full screen? Yep. <laughs> no, it is not. There we go. There we go. Okay, great. All right, so um, yeah, I'm just gonna do a quick overview of the Houston Metro passes and fare structure, um, kind of as a follow-up from um, my presentation from a couple of weeks ago. Um, Houston is, we've recognized it as what, uh, an, an agency that we want to kind of look deeper into because of the um, lower fares, the flat fares, and just the more simplified structure overall. Um, Houston is a smaller area, um, a smaller service area, and a larger population, so it's denser, and so that will have implications for the service efficiency as well. But um, so going into the actual structure of the passes, um, so here we go, sharing it. Yeah. So um, there's the Metro Q fare card, so that's just a reloadable card, um, and you charge it online. And for every 50 trips um, you make, you get five free trips. So that is kind of the incentive to use that uh, media. And then there's also the Metro Day Pass, um, which is more cost effective if you ride three times or more daily, uh, because the Metro Day Pass does cap after three rides. And then there's Metro Money, which is just a pre-designated amount on a card not reloadable you just use it and then um, that's that and then there's also um, mobile online ticketing um, which is just an in-app purchase and then they also do cash as well so this is just a comparison of the metro q fare card and the metro day pass which is the two main fare cards the main difference here is that the Metro Q fare card offers more um, the best value for somebody who would ride once or twice daily versus um, the Metro Day Pass, which um, you tap, you use um, on your first and second ride, you pay full price. And then the third ride, you pay half price. And then after that, it caps, so you don't pay any additional fare for the day until um, the day is over. Um, and then there's some other comparisons, but they're pretty similar overall other than that um, main aspect. And so this is the fare structure and the discounts. So for the local bus, the Metro Rail and the Metro Rapid, it is 125 per ride, a flat rate in the local Houston area. And then the discount, um, which applies to certain groups is half, half off and it's rounded down to um, 60 cents. Um, so the discounted rate applies to students, uh, seniors 65 to 69 and people with disabilities. And then there's also a free fare for children, jurors, seniors 70 and over and Metro veterans pass holders who are decorated or disabled veterans. Um, and then, so this 125 fare applies to the Houston downtown area. Um, and then there's also park and ride zones uh, for commuters outside of Houston. And those are a little more varied. So um, these are the fares for the different zones. Um, Houston's that central area. Um, and then just I, I had to look it up because I'm not familiar with the Houston area, but Conroe um, would be about 40 miles outside of Houston. So that's kind of that distance in that farthest zone. And then um, in the closest zone, like Maxie Road, that's about 12 miles out from um, the Houston center. Um, so I think one thing that came up here, I think, I can add it. So these are just some extra links um, to follow if you're curious. But one thing that came up when I was um, sharing this with the finance committee this morning um, was what impact that this might have on, um, what impact that the low fares might have on um, operating funding sources. So Houston's um, fares make up about 12% of their operating 
funding source versus RTD, um, where in 2019, we had 23% of um, the operating funds were made up of fares. So um, that is one thing that um, came up this morning that I wanted to add as well. And that is all I have. Great, thank you so much, Natalie. I want to check in with folks on the committee just to see if there's any additional question. And then, um, Stephen, since you're still on the line, and I know you all are, Transit Center is very familiar with other cities. If you have anything else to add, that would be fantastic. So um, we'll open it up to questions from the committee. Do you know how Houston makes up the remainder of the fare? How is it funded? I don't recall. Is this sales tax? Is it a? Um, overall, it's, oh, Matthew can answer it. It's local funds, but I don't know what that actually consists of. So this question was asked at the Finance Committee uh, earlier this morning, and I looked it up, I Googled it, and they have a sales tax. Do you know what percentage the sales tax is? And then Elise, yeah, um, you next. I believe it was a 1% sales tax. Okay. That's all right. I'd have to look that up again. That's okay. Um, Elise? Well, I was just curious. I mean, the again, with the balance between having cheaper fares that increase ridership um, versus higher fares that maybe depress it. It seems like there's a sweet spot. And I'm just curious, maybe this is a question for Stephen, or I, I, maybe Natalie knows, just um, if there's been any studies regarding what that sweet spot is, if you, and I don't know, basically you wanna fill up your transit system. And even if those fares are lower fares, you're, you're um, you know, incre increasing, you know, revenue potential there. And I'm just curious if, how other agencies have dealt with that balance point. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, in, in the, in the current circumstances, things are a little, things are a little out of, out of whack. It's very hard. It's hard to imagine, um, raising fares as a, as a way to increase revenue with, with um, you know, the way ridership has been depressed. Um, generally, generally speaking, the, um, the transit literature tends to suggest that, you know, when you, when you increase, when you increase fares, you depress ridership, but, but not so much that you, you know, you you still come out ahead from a financial perspective. Whether that is the best thing for riders is a is a different question. Um, and that there may the the longer term uh, effect on ridership may be greater than the shorter term effect as people adjust their behavior. Um, so, I was more thinking yeah. the opposite, where people lower fares to fill up buses, and and whether or not, obviously, you take a financial hit if there are lower fares, but you are increasing ridership, and mm -hmm. um, that was sort of more where I was headed with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I see. I see. Um, I think that. Um, you know some of the examples that are more prominent in the research um, in New York, for example, there was a, there was a situation in the '90s where there was a lot of um, we had a lot of what we called two fare zones, and with a change in the fare payment system, um, it became much closer to a flat fare, so that people traveling longer distances weren't paying as much, and that that led to a very large increase in ridership. Um, I know that's a little bit of a different situation than um, just sort of lowering the fare in and across the board way, but it does suggest that there's some real sensitivity there. Thanks. <clears throat> Brett? 
You know, the one thing that so often is ignored in looking at fares and the effect on ridership and the benefit of lowering and raising is, is the implications for congestion of having a healthy ridership on your mass transit system. If you look at how a lot of like fast tracks, which was our light rail system, a big part of how that was sold was this is going to make congestion, give us less congestion. And there is a, is a real price to congestion. And uh, uh, UT Austin uh, used to do, I don't know if they're still doing this, great surveys to estimate the cost of a lost time that people had as a result of congestion. And, and the more people, one of the importance of using ridership to drive our decisions about, about mass transit, I think, is that ridership, those are people that were taken off the road. Most of those people are single occupancy vehicles. And that has huge value, especially when you look at the, oh, what is it, six billion or so that we just spent to widen I-70, or maybe it's three, it's billions. So um, yeah. I just wanted to bring that small point out. Yeah, I think um, in terms of the work of this committee, I think that it gets back to an earlier point that um, Elise raised, um, around like what is the role of this committee and and in either supporting rtd rtd's board and or making uh recommendations for these larger goals so getting back to the the purpose of the report and just lifting up what is our overall what is the goal right what is the what is it that we're trying to do um we being what is it that rtd is trying to do is it increased ridership is it um you know, ensuring equitable access to transportation, but being really explicit and then ensuring that our fare and our um, past structures, so our, our fare structures and our past structures ultimately allow us to to achieve those goals in, in, a, uh, in an achievable and realizable way. Like, what does this actually look like? But I think that's going to need to be something that this committee um, we, we need to wrestle with a little bit. Like, what is what is our role? Is it making recommendations to the RTD board do we want to just suggest a couple of things that we've learned based on our based on our research that would be helpful um so I will just leave it there I see Elise you unmuted yourself well I just wanted to encourage I, I do think this committee should take advantage of its recommendation making role to suggest um goals around this I I do I I guess I have a further point about that is um I, I think increasing ridership is key. Um, it's key for a lot of things that aren't paying into the system though. And and that's sort of what Rut was getting at is increasing ridership not only fixes congestion, air quality, um, climate emissions, um, as well as providing um, sort of equitable mobility um, if, you, if we price it right. Um, but none of the, we need to figure out how to get um, those public goods to help pay for the transit and rather than trying to do it through fares and that's the i think a tricky piece of this is um figuring out how to monetize some of the benefits that a, um, a robust a more robust ridership on rtd system brings So I think I, mean, I, I just want to acknowledge time. We have about 10 minutes left. Are there any additional questions either for Stephen and or Natalie before we wrap up and, and move into at least what I'm seeing as a potential next steps? Hey, so Daya, I had one question sort of related to what you guys were just talking about that, and sorry, I was having a little tech problem and couldn't get to it. So it's Chris. Um, what would be our goal if it wasn't to increase ridership? Like in what scenario would we have a goal of decreasing ridership or keeping ridership the same. Yeah, Elise and then Jackie, and then I can jump in. <laughs> okay, I don't think cool. it's yeah. that, that we would ever want to decrease ridership, but you could say um, revenue generation or paying covering your costs or a higher purpose, which then would cause you to have higher fares that could then de depress ridership. If you led with increasing ridership, that would that would encourage you to lower fares. So, but that doesn't. It, it, but what, that doesn't have to mean lowering revenue, right? 
So if the price went down 75% and ridership went up 50%, and revenue would go up. The cost of running a bus is always the same, regardless of the number of people are on it. So if there's one person on the bus, that bus is running, it costs you know, $1,000 to run it that day. If one person rides it 10 times, then, then you get 10 bucks and that didn't work very well. But if you get 20 people on that bus, a bus costs the same to go no matter what, no matter how full or empty, it costs mm-hmm. the same. And so I, I, I don't see those two things as like, I, I don't think fares are, could ever really be a source of revenue to, to balance the budget would be my bet. So like, it, it, I know I asked a question and you answered it. And now I'm arguing with you, which isn't fair. I, I don't mean it that way. <laughs> no, so, I've had this argument you know, with RTD think, so just trying many to understand times it. Yeah. about trying to fill up buses. There is no yeah. cost of filling up buses. Now, RTD will argue back, yeah, but if you're too good, you'll make me have to run a second bus. And that's a whole slew of co- additional costs. Um, and that's the mm-hmm. the calculus around how do you pay for the, how much the pass program should cost. So I don't disagree with you, but I think, I think it's a question of how you prioritize your goals. Yeah. Okay. Somebody, sure. uh, yeah, Jackie might have had something. Yeah, I'm not sure. No, this is Jackie. I was just going to say I think there's just trade-offs associated with what you're prioritizing, right? And 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 then the other thing is, uh, what are other funding sources? We we've acknowledged on this call that there are a number of other benefits associated with increased transit ridership, and the the those entities that are benefiting are not necessarily paying for those benefits, right? So is there a way to capture that as well? Um, so uh, that's really it. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. I, I think just pop in really quick. Uh, in in terms of the goals, I, I think my takeaway was that it's not one insular goal, right? It's multiple goals and it's really what is the what are the real what's the relationship between each of our um, each of our aspirations, if you will, for this regional transit system, right? So increasing ridership could be one of them, but then thinking about what's the equity impact on specific customers, and then thinking about um, our, I made a note, but ease of use, which we have mentioned several times in, in this committee itself, you know, how do we ease and, and improve um, the customer experience, the user experience, so that it's not necessarily uh, cumbersome to use RTD, and, and that could then be unpacked. But I think that's kind of what my takeaway was, is that having fare box recovery be the sole goal and increased ridership or increased ridership as the sole goal cannot, uh, may not necessarily be the best way. Um, and having this more intersectional thinking might be helpful. Um, that was my key takeaway from this kind of conversation. Um, Lynn, I I see that you hopped on, so I just want to check in and see if you have anything else to add. Just, you know, that the the world has changed, obviously, and ridership is is going to have to be a huge goal um, returning. Uh, Before that, uh, Chris is at least kind of saying, you know, every ride is subsidized. So if you get beyond that first bus, then you have have another one and, and RTD had the workforce issues <coughs> so we didn't have enough drivers um, so those were sort of the balance but um, clearly those aren't uh, you know those are different issues now yes we are yeah, it's because we're all different place. Place. I sometimes find the subsidized word sort of frustrating just because I don't think we apply that word, and I, I'm an amateur here, but I don't think we apply that word to any other mode of transit. So, like, I ride my bike downtown, I ride on a bike trail. And was that subsidized? Because I, I definitely didn't pay for that bike trail. So, yes, it, it know, is. Like, yeah, okay. <laughs> we never, we only use subsidized when we talk about transit. We never, we don't, the, the damn road to, Denver, to Vail. You know, yes, we'd like to build a train, but the road costs billions too, and the gas tax don't cover it. So, fairly certain that's subsidized too. Anyway, small, 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 small. Important point from the peanut gallery. (laughs) 
Yes. But it, 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 I think it's important to recognize what you just said. And I think the average person driving their car feels like that road has been paid for and they don't acknowledge the ongoing maintenance. So until you get involved in local government associated with maintaining that road and, and um, but, it, but it is true. I think P, uh, the public in general thinks you build it once and then that's it. They don't think about what it costs to plow, overlay, stripe, uh, put up the uh, appropriate uh, traffic, uh, uh, speed signs, stop lights, police. all of those things. Police and, it, so. you gotta police it. Long-term maintenance, yeah. So we are at about three minutes left. In terms of next steps, I, mean, I feel like we might be at a point where we can start to pull out um, some potential ideal goals, or at least that might be another point of conversation for us. Maybe if we can spend some time at the next call, kind of diving into, um, based on all of our conversations today, what, some, what our recommendation would be, and then what would these potential goals, um, what might be some potential goals that we wanna at least explore, again, as a recommendation potentially of this committee. Uh, I feel like that might be getting, getting us close to kind of landing at least this draft version of the plane um, and get us to where we had aspired to when we were talking about um, just having some uh, some sort of draft to present, <laughs> um, especially at the end of the year report. So I wanna, I'll, I'll work with you, Matthew, and, and we can, I'll take a first go and we can just kind of work on that together. And then I'd love to get that out for feedback from this group in particular. Um, Stephen, you'll get the, the presentation over to Matthew so that we can get that out to the group. And I think one other thing for us to just keep in mind is um, if there's other research or other things that we may want to potentially tap into Transit Center, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to facilitate that conversation, whatever that might look like. Um, are there any other additional next steps that folks have uh, or any other items, matters that folks want to mention at this time before we close out this meeting? I've never quite figured out, we haven't really discussed in terms of, um, the one thing that I've thought about a lot and that is we're coming towards the end of the year and starting to think about recommendations is, um, one place I think that's really a possibility of local um, and regional um, cooperation is to start to figure out how to improve the bus ride versus the car ride. And I'm sort of obsessed with it um, and I don't know, uh, I, I only, I only know it anecdotally, but on 15th Street in downtown Denver, they took out two car lanes and put in two bus only lanes. And mm -hmm. the impact, as I understand it, was to that the bus ridership went through the roof on that line. Number two, the bus times improved dramatically downward. Uh, and number three, just to make things fun, the driver experience in individual cars improved dramatically because the two weren't riding all together. And it seems to me that that's a place that there's real opportunity across the board, particularly if our focus is to improve ridership. And the mm -hmm. bus becomes a better way to get around or at least has a chance where it doesn't have to stop and be stuck in traffic. It's got a better chance of, of ridership and it's the kind of thing that can have a lot of cooperation. So we haven't talked about that. I feel like that could also just be lifted up, Chris, within one of the goals that then we start to work um, work from right so I, i'm looking at for example king county and they have regional coordination right so that starts to get into well how do we actually achieve that goal um which could be around land use policy so then from there we start to i would say think about what potential strategies we have that ultimately get yeah. us to achieve that goal but having this as like our guiding principles um and and drivers i think that would also help us to keep a little focused um and to have a little bit more structure moving into the recommendation mm -hmm. all right yeah i wonder if some of that might be part of the governance structure conversation too about sort of what locals might bring to the table as part of their partnership in working on the local piece of it i mean it could be incentivized with more money flowing in places where bus bus friendly policies are put into place that kind of thing but Maybe we should talk about that with um, Julie. Julie, yes, that makes sense. Great. All right, so I want to acknowledge we are at time. It is, we are over time, it is 4.01. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um,
we will see you next meeting. <laughs> Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks,